Graham Stringer. Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker, the, uh, the government has been clear that it recognises, of course, the principle that there is a link between the size of the legislature and the executive, so we've said that we will consider uh, how to address this issue in the future. Graham Stringer. Last year, Mr Speaker, the Deputy Prime Minister said he wanted to reduce the size of the uh, government to 73. Actually, the payroll vote has gone up to 140 in this House, which is 43 per cent the way to a majority. Hasn't he increased the size of the payroll vote so that he can get through this House many of his broken promises? Yeah. Yeah. I think the, the, the issue of principle is that is there a link, as I say, between the size of the executive and the size of the legislature? And I, I think there is. Clearly there is. Now, the size of the legislature will be reduced from 2015. So clearly there is a question for the next Parliament and indeed the next uh, government about what the size of the executive... Well, could, well, the, the, the Honourable Lady from Sedgwick says do it now. The size of the legislature is not actually being reduced right now, so it's not something that we need to do right now. We've accepted, we've accepted the principle. It's now 2011. We've got four years until 2015. We will reflect on this and we will act. Anne McIntosh. Would the Deputy Prime Minister agree to extend the link to the Shannon administration? Yeah. And does he concern, share the concern on this side of the House at the growing number of those serving in the Shadow administration? Uh, Mr Speaker, I, I'm, I've, I've lost sort of really, I've lost count of who's doing what in the Shadow administration, as she calls it, except for the Right Honourable Lady who's got an increasingly long list of um, uh, responsibilities to uh, her name. I think the serious point, though, is what is, what is the relationship between the Legislature and the Executive? of the day and the point that I'm seeking to make is that there is a absolute link in principle between the size of one and the other and that is something that we will act on in the years ahead. Order. Topical question. Sheila Gilmore. Mr. Speaker, as Deputy Prime Minister, I support the Prime Minister on the full range of government policy and initiatives, and within government, I take special responsibility for this government's programme of political and constitutional reform. Sheila Gilmore. Uh, given the Deputy Prime Minister's role in using constitutional reform to restore trust in politics, is he satisfied that the Secretary of, of State for Defence made a full and frank uh, declaration of interest in relation to his links to Adam Werity and his security company? No. Mr. Speaker, my, my uh, right honourable friend, the Secretary of State for Defence, uh, came before this House for an hour uh, yesterday. He was open in acknowledging uh, and apologising for what he concedes was a blurring of the, uh, uh, the professional, the political and the, and the personal. Uh, clearly that raises serious issues, as he acknowledges, and those serious issues are now being examined by the most uh, senior civil servant in government. Uh, and I think until we know what that report says, uh, I would suggest that it is unwise to prejudge exactly what happened. Stevenson. Uh, the government is proposing individual voter registration, which I fully support, but will the government at the same time review the use of postal votes? Well, I certainly think as a matter of principle we should be giving enough resources to uh, um, uh, electoral uh, officers to check uh, in theory, every single uh, postal vote, because it is an area where I think there has been some concern uh, about fraud in, in the past, and we are absolutely determined to make sure that those resources are available. Harriet Harman. Yeah. Mr Speaker, the Deputy Prime Minister has always lectured us on high standards in public office, but while the Defence Secretary, by his own admission, has fallen short of those standards, the Government has failed to refer him to the independent adviser on Minister's interests, Sir Philip Moore. Doesn't this show that they are prepared to sacrifice high standards in public office to protect the Secretary of State? Yeah. I'm sure she, she would agree with me that it's also important to uh, respect high standards of due process and fair play. The, 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 cabinet, the, the, the Cabinet Secretary is looking into this, as, by the way, requested by her and her party until they changed their tune just a day or two ago. He is now doing that work. He is doing that uh, report. And until we have got that report and until that report has been delivered to the Prime Minister, I think there's no point trying to provide a running commentary on a series of facts which aren't yet revealed in that report. Harriet Harman. No, Mr Speaker, that isn't good enough. The code, the Ministerial Code of Conduct says... It is not the role of the cabinet.
Cabinet Secretary or other officials to enforce the code. The Prime Minister has admitted the Defence Secretary has made serious mistakes and there is clearly a need for investigation, not least into whether Mr Werity profited by his association with the Secretary of State. Why are they blocking the proper investigation? This goes to the heart of trust in government. Yeah. The, the, I think the first point is, uh, has the Secretary of State uh, uh, apologised and admitted, uh, admitted that something was amiss? Yes, yes he has. Secondly, Secondly, has the Prime Minister made clear that this is something he takes very seriously? Yes. Thirdly, is it being properly investigated? Yes, it is. Well, she now says no, but until quite recently, this was precisely what she was urging us to do in government. Uh, I think rather than constantly chopping and changing who does the investigation, who produces the report, let's, let's allow the Cabinet Secretary to do the work that he's been asked to do so that the full facts can be made available to the Prime Minister and then decisions can be made. Amber Rudd. Speaker, according to the Local Government Association, only 31% of local councillors are women. And in my own, sadly, Labour-run Hastings Borough Council, that number is 22%. Does the Deputy Prime Minister agree that we must do as politicians all we can locally to ensure that as many women come forward to put themselves up as local councillors so that local politicians don't also remain pale and male? Yeah. Uh, yes, I, I, I strongly, uh, agree with, uh, strongly agree with her. And, uh, I think one of the ways we can do that is, of course, seeking to set an example uh, in this place. And I freely admit, <laughs> I, 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 I freely admit, I freely admit that that is not something that that is not something which um, uh, my party has been particularly successful in. It's one of the things that I will be seeking to change as quickly as possible. Eighty Clark. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Given the open warfare we saw at the Conservative Party conference from front bench spokespeople on the Human Rights Act. Will the Deputy Prime Minister use his position to explain the benefits of the legislation and put right inf yeah, misinformation? Yeah, yeah. 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 Mr Speaker, uh, uh, as, uh, as the Honourable Lady knows, the Human Rights Act simply translates into domestic law a convention which I think everybody agrees we will always remain signatories uh, to. And so, it, in a sense, it prevents, it prevents British citizens from seeking justice in European courts where they can be delivered in British courts. But as, as she knows, the coalition uh, government and it's set out in the coalition agreement, is uh, committed to setting up a commission, which we've established, which will look into the case of creating a British Bill of Rights, which will build on and incorporate all the existing rights and responsibilities that already exist. Edward Timpson. Mr Speaker, uh, how will the government ensure that the views of local residents are heard loud and clear where local authorities are seeking planning permission for authorised gypsy and travellers sites, as is currently the case in my constituency in Crewe? As, as I hope he's aware, the Localism Bill gives a raft of new rights to uh, local communities and local people to make their views known on a whole range of issues, from uh, local planning decisions to uh, increases in council tax uh, and so on. In my view, the Localism Bill represents one of the biggest transfers of power, not only from Westminster to the Town Hall, but onwards from the Town Hall to all the local communities that we represent. John Speller. The Prime Minister has conceded that the Defence Secretary's conduct fell below the standards expected. So why is he still resisting putting the case to the independent adviser on ministers' interests where he could have due process and these things could be properly examined? Yeah. As I explained earlier, we've asked the Cabinet Secretary in a, in a, in a, in a, in a way which um, is wholly familiar and traditional, as he will know, it was done countless times by previous governments, was demanded by his own party to look into this, to complete, complete an investigation, to produce a report, and that's exactly what he's now doing. Sir Robert Smith. Speaker, does the Deputy Prime Minister agree that prolonged uncertainty over the referendum on Scottish independence risks undermining investor confidence in the Scottish economy? Uh, I, I strongly agree with my right honourable uh, friend. I think as long as um, the First Minister sort of plays cat and mouse, I probably shouldn't mention cats, but um, ca ca cat and mouse with the Scottish people, um, uh, it is extremely confusing to people. It's very unsettling to the business community, and I don't think it does the Scottish economy uh, any good. He believes in independence. 
and I think he should have the courage of his convictions to come forward and put that proposition before the Scottish people. Yes or no? Does he want to yank Scotland out of the United Kingdom or not? Instead, he now seems to be presenting a series of multiple choice questions to the Scottish people, which is increasingly uh, uh, confusing. I think he should have the courage of his convictions and ask the Scottish people as quickly as possible, do they believe in full independence? Yes or no? Una McTaggart. People will be registered to vote as a result of individual voter registration. Well, as she knows, the, uh, the electoral register at the moment um, has about 92, it's about 92 per cent of coverage, and we are doing everything through data matching. Um, through the transitional arrangements that I've described, through some of the debates we talked about here about opt-outs or not, to ensure that that level does not decrease uh, in any meaningful way. It's a high level of registration compared to similar exercises in other parts of the democratic world, and I hope we remain those high, keep those high standards. Economic news from Europe is very tr troubling. Could the Deputy Prime Minister set out what he and his government are doing to ensure that swift and decisive action is taken in relation to the uh, Eurozone crisis? Speaker, Mr. Speaker the, the Prime Minister, the Chancellor, myself and others are, of course, in constant contact with um, uh, uh, governments elsewhere in the Eurozone and indeed in other parts of the European Union. We have been quite clear that it is not our role to seek to somehow try and uh, dictate what should uh, happen, uh, other than to say that the solution needs to be uh, developed urgently. It needs to be comprehensive. It needs to be decisive. It needs to deal with the uh, Greek situation in a decisive manner. It needs to uh, create means by which contagion can be stopped from Greece to, to elsewhere in the uh, Eurozone. It needs binding rules so that the fiscal disciplines in the Eurozone are respected in the, uh, in the future, that banks are recapitalised, and something where I think Britain could really lead on also that we should work as 27, not as a sort of fractured European Union, to increase competitiveness and further liberalisation within the single market, because that's the, way, that's the way we increase the European Union's welfare in the future. On Hugh Aranka Davis. Sorry, Mr Speaker. The uh, country watched amazement yesterday evening and afternoon as one by one apologists for the Secretary of State of Defence explained that the ministerial code was not written in stone. Uh, indeed it isn't. It's written in black and white. So why is this coalition government actually trying to rewrite at least the spirit of the ministerial code, if not the letter? We're not. We're very clear that the ministerial code, of course, no. I'm very clear, of course, that uh, everybody in this government should abide by the very highest available standards and should abide by the ministerial code, both the spirit and the letter. And that is exactly what the Cabinet Secretary has been asked to look into and adjudicate on in his report. Carmichael. Speaker, in view of the continued pressures on small businesses in terms of securing bank lending, will the Deputy Prime Minister join me in urging that uh, a reform of the banking structure actually produces bankers in that sector which are fully understand the needs, requirements and priorities of small businesses? I strongly agree with him. I think the, I think the relationship between uh, our banks and small and medium-sized businesses is possibly one of the, the most important issue for the long-term prosperity of the country. And I think one of the many virtues of the Vickers report which we have been very clear in principle we're going to uh, implement, is precisely that it will create a kind of firewall in the banking system so that there will be uh, a real um, uh, vocation, if you like, within the banking industry to support traditional customers like small and medium-sized businesses in a way which I think has actually kind of slightly withered on the vine in recent years. Lindsay Roy. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Does the Deputy Prime Minister believe that the Supreme Court should continue to have a UK-wide role, even at a time when there are stronger devolved administrations? Yes, I think uh, in keeping with all uh, judicial systems in all countries which have a high degree of devolution, as we do, uh, it is right that uh, at the sort of apex of the judicial system, there should be a highest court, a Supreme Court, which is able to um, oversee the sort of jurisdiction of all of the nations of the United Kingdom. Simon Hughes. Speaker, will my right honourable friend give me an assurance that given the really difficult economic situation the government inherited and the really difficult economic situation we are grappling with at home and abroad, that those who have in the public sector and particularly in the private sector had high or obscene salaries and bonuses will be dealt with in a way that those with the broadest shoulders in the days ahead will bear the burden of getting us out of this mess and those who are with the lowest incomes will be best protected. Yeah. 
Mr. Speaker, I certainly um, agree with my right honourable friend that um, uh, all, uh, all executives and shareholders in the private sector have got to bear in mind that they do have a wider uh, social responsibility. They're not somehow exempt from normal social norms. And at a time when million and millions of people on low and ordinary incomes are really uh, feeling the strain, it is right that they should exercise some restraint in the way in which they remunerate themselves. It's also why it's so important that we do exactly what this government is doing, which is first giving tax breaks to those on low and medium incomes and not rushing to do so to those with the wealthiest incomes.